it's time for you all to wake up and shift your paradigm. This world is the kingdom of darkness and we are living in its last days. It won't be long before the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat and the earth and everything therein shall be burnt up. The Luciferian elite have been setting up the new world order and now they've established the globalist beast system for the rise of that wicked one and revealing of the man of sin who comes after the workings of Satan. Don't take my word for it. Read the Bible and you'll know that perilous times shall come in the last days. And we are in the last days. Hello, brothers and sisters, and welcome to another edition of the Remnant Report. I am your host, Pastor Jeremy Anderson, aka the Remnant Warrior. And tonight we have a very special episode for you guys. We've got a very special guest on Gary Wayne, ho uh, host, author of the Genesis 6 Conspiracy, is on again with us. Uh, he ha Gary hasn't been on the Remnant Report since uh, 2020, and it's been a long time coming, and I am just thrilled to have him back on. I know you guys will be thrilled to hear the content. I have gotten an excellent amount of response to the 15-minute clip I played of Gary speaking on tonight's subject on someone else's show, so I know that you guys are interested in this topic. I am definitely interested in it. I know John knows quite a bit about it as well. Tonight's topic, of course, is the occult origins of quantum physics, things like, um, well, uh, quantum mechanics, particle physics, uh, things that people like Albert Einstein and many others that Brother Gary Wayne will tell you all about. Uh, that's what we're going to be discussing tonight. And as soon as I, I heard him talk about it the first time, I started researching it and it was like, dude, you've written a book on the Kabbalah. How did you not notice <laughs> that? How did how did you not connect the dots between the the sparks in the Kabbalah and the the particles and and things like CERN and particle physics and you know quantum mechanics? But that is what we are going to be talking about tonight. Tonight, co-hosting with me, we've got Brother Jeremy Stone and also Brother John Brisson from By Their Roots, and uh, we're gonna have. An excellent time tonight. Uh, Brother Gary, how are you doing this evening? Uh, I am doing fine, and uh, thank you for inviting me back and looking forward to the conversation tonight, because if people aren't really familiar with this subject, you've heard kind of part of the story, but not all of the story, and I don't know whether we'll get to all of it or not, but I think we'll raise some eyebrows about it. I believe you are absolutely right. How about you, John, Jeremy? How are you guys doing this evening? Doing Hi, well. John. Doing well, Jeremy. Uh, glad to be here on with um, Gary Wayne, someone who I admire, uh, and I've heard him on many shows, and actually I've read his book too as well, The Genesis 6 Conspiracy. Uh, so I'm definitely glad uh, to discuss one of my uh, favorite topics as a former New Ager and a current creationist from a biblical perspective, science teacher uh, at, the, at the Christian school that I teach at, uh, to discuss both the, um, the, the mystic origins, Gnostic origins of um, quantum mechanics and uh, the modern infiltration of quantum mechanics being uh, pushed uh, by people like Dan Brown. Uh, in his book, The Lost Symbol. Uh, and so yeah, as a former New Ager, someone who used to believe in quantum mechanics uh, is the way it's taught in a mystical standpoint. Um, it is very enticing to people out there 
um, and it is complete. Um, it's completely wrong uh, and uh, against the word of God. So. And I'm doing well tonight, Jeremy. Thanks for having me on. And uh, it's good to be here with with John and Gary. We were supposed to have them on uh, by their fruits the other night, but didn't work out. I got the days mixed up. So it's good to be here. And I'm I'm excited to learn uh, the topic at hand because I'm a layman man. Yeah, man so I'm so. going to learn just as much as the audience is going to learn. But I'm excited for that. And it, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, as always, I always love when you guys are able to come on and co-host with me or that whenever we team up to do the roundtable discussions. And I know the audience loves it as well. So without any further ado, I'm just going to turn it over to Gary and let him take it away. Okay. So um, I'm, I'm showing a, a bit of a weak internet connection. Uh, I've checked my upload. Mine's quite strong. So there's a little bit of freeze up going on on the screen. So bear with me if I, if I miss something, but onward and upward, so to speak. So we're entering in an age of unbridled advancement in technology in AI, quantum computing, cryptocurrency, uh, things that are developing faster than uh, you know ever has happened before. And that, that technology is advancing so quickly that um, it's hard to imagine what they can be doing over the next two or three years, because there was a time when I used to track it and it's like 20 or 30 years ago where technology and knowledge was starting to advance at a doubling rate of every five years. And now you, you have quantum computing that's matching with AI that can uh, do what it would take 10,000 years for a supercomputer to do. It can do in literally seconds. And when you're developing that sort of technology, it really becomes, can you actually keep up with what they're doing and can you actually understand what they're doing? And it's ultimately all sort of designed to get to the ultimate, what I think beast mark system uh, that we're seeing and developing in parallel lanes. The level that they're doing it, it's so basic in terms of understanding it from the seven sacred sciences that Uh, linked up with angelic knowledge or God's knowledge that created the antediluvian epoch into destruction. And I think that's what we're starting to see today. So why not not to be surprised then that a lot of this knowledge is based on polytheist uh, scripture, polytheist occult knowledge. And that doesn't mean that they're not developing it. It means that they're going to use it for evil as opposed to good. And that's what we really sort of have to be concerned of. So people know about CERN and CERN is one of those locations in the world that is uh, doing things that are not sort of advertised. What they advertise is the superficial things that they keep people sort of busy with, but underneath they're looking for something else. And at those locations, most people might be aware that there are uh, AI and quantum computing technology uh, Uh, that is partnering together into multiple dimensions, but its limitation is that it has it's like a rifle shot compared to a shotgun. So AI magnifies that search capability so that it becomes uh, able to do a lot more things in all dimensions at the same time, and they're able to do more all of the time. And this is at the heart of the beast technology that they want to bring about. And so they're going to continue to do it. And it is a system that uh, if we understand quantum computing, well, we should understand that it's a sort of a newer science. It's maybe 150 years old at the, at the outside. And they had some pioneers with quantum uh, mechanics, which is the basis for establishing quantum computing. So you got people like Niels Bohr and uh, Werner Heisenberg and Schrodinger was a, another one that was one of the early people that were doing it. Of course, it was taken over by other people, but there was a tradition that was started in that research in terms to be able to understand the philosophy of it. And when I say that, I mean the theology of it, because philosophy 
is the combination of the first three sciences um, that is an arbitrator for all of the other sciences and is considered superior and it merges all of the sciences. And philosophy is rooted in Greek for the word uh, love, as in uh, philo and Sophia. So the love of Sophia or the love of wisdom. Uh, I think there might be a question you wanted to ask. I see a yeah, finger up. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask, um, I know about Heisenberg and Schrodinger and um, Niels Bohr, but wasn't um, Einstein and Nikola Tesla and even Edison, weren't they um, into the occult? Yeah, so Edison and Tesla were doing things with obviously inside knowledge, but not with all of the sciences and everything. So they're kind of searching blindly, touching in and around it, but not sort of really getting there. You have Einstein who comes along after, who starts to add his thinking and his math that starts to bring in all of the new sort of theories. But in the basics, these are the ones that are sort of understood as the pioneers. And so, you know, they consulted the Vedas. They consulted the Upanishads. They uh, consulted the uh, Bhagavad Gita. And uh, they did that for a reason. They believed that to understand quantum mechanics, you have to understand the Vedas and the Upanishads and all of the writings that are in Eastern Hinduism. And it provides a, as I say, a philosophy or theology of what they're looking for or some of the things that they're trying to do. So we need to understand that this is a premise that has followed the sciences of polytheism. It's a knowledge cult, right? It's Gnosticism, Gnosis, the tree of good and evil, as they would call the tree of Gnosis or the tree of wisdom in, in their religion. And it's the development of this. And it's like, as we talked about earlier, it is the application that determines whether it's good or evil. But this is, gets into a level that I'm not so sure you could ever control the good of it because of what's really behind the power of what they're trying to put into place. So they believe that in this... Uh, religious theology, the science that they're developing, they believe that uh, the world acts like a quantum computer. So hence the development of the quantum mechanics and the requirement for AI. And that it is a quantum computer with intelligence, uh, not necessarily artificial intelligence, but it has uh, intelligence behind it. And so everything that they're trying to create today is in the image of this quantum mechanics that's completely tied to polytheism and angelic technology that destroyed uh, the world before the flood. And they believe the universe is a hologram or a matrix, right? So it's a projection. And so at the bottom of that is, is that this universe is traded in information. And that this information is readily available, but at the quantum level. So we're talking something that you can barely even measure. You can measure through science some particles, but there's one particle that they're looking for that they can't measure. And that's the ultimate particle that they're trying to identify, not just the dark matter and things like that and how all of this interacts with dark matter, but they're looking for a particle that merges with a particle you can measure. And it's an invisible particle that is even invisible as it merges with this particle. And through quantum entanglement, it can transfer its properties through all dimensions instantaneously. Is that the at man or whatever? That's what they would call the atma particle or the at man particle. And another thing that it may be understood as is the divine essence, which is very, very popular um, ideology in uh, the New Age movement and in the Eastern movement. So it might also be called the Brahman in the Vedas. It's the same ideology, but this is this is something even more polytheist. If I if once we get to the heart of it, so within this particle. It controls all, it holds all of the information in the universe and all universes. So they're searching for unlimited knowledge. So like the Akashic Records. 
that they yeah. discuss a lot within new age circles, kind of more of a scientific kind of pseudoscientific push for that per se. Yeah. But bar bigger than that. Yeah. And yeah. And bigger. Yeah. But on, yes, but it would be similar in sort of that kind of understanding. So this is a, this is a particle that, that, th that they're trying to find because in polytheism, they're trying to offer godhood in the physical realm. So in the physical realm, to be a god, you would have to be immortal. Yeah. And you would also have to have access to unlimited knowledge. And they're also in their ideology, they're trying to reinstate the state of Eden. So biblically, we would understand that, that in Eden is Adam was deceived by Eve, who was deceived by the Nahash, the serpent, to eat from the tree of good and evil, the only rule that they couldn't break. And they chose to do so. And because that would make them like God, all knowing. Of course, what the Nahash and Satan, who was probably uh, sponsoring the serpent, um, didn't tell even Adam is that if they broke the, the rule, they wouldn't have access to the tree of life anymore. And so they were banned. So they got to be sort of all knowing from the ideology of how to, how to apply the knowledge, both good and evil, and how to develop it accordingly. But now they lost uh, that immortality from the tree of life. So polytheism promises to God. bring both together so they can be like God, right? And so this is what they're going to try and offer. And through this knowledge, they'll be able to offer a physical kind of immortality. Yeah. And this is a system that they believe can be channeled through, you know, a very, very advanced system. That's like in a cloud basis that would be delivered through an implant, just as the Davos crew in 2017 said the um, the mark or the uh, implant system would come through the healthcare system because people would demand it not only to just ward off pestilences and give longer life, but to ultimately solve all of the physical aspects, but also understanding that they'll have that tied into cryptocurrency. Uh, as well, and that, you know, the understanding of cryptocurrency and opening portals and things into different dimensions, that's all part of the polytheist geomancy sort of concept. Uh, it can mean a few different things. One of them is specifically this and into and into multiple dimensions. And they're going to need a digital currency that uh, works with this system. That's why you have all the development of crypto, just as crypto is geomancy. They're sort of kind of synonymous. And that the quantum capability has the ability to crack all crypto programs and so there's going to be another development there's be a, there'll be a two level position one for the people who have lots of money that they will not leave any sort of imprint and nothing can be cracked with the, what they're going to present and then there's the rest of the world so they can control you so this is the system that they're, they're that they're trying to sort of bring up bring about and this is a particle that is, is sort of all-knowing but it's operated by a being a supreme kind of being in the eastern religions as we talked about um, and it is the divine spirit it is the supreme spirit the supreme spirit of knowledge we understand this as a gnostic term as sophia again yeah the mother goddess of the archons that would include in their belief system the god of the bible this is a counterfeit of the holy spirit not only is it will it be violating physical creation but it's counterfeiting the holy spirit and it's blaspheming the holy spirit so once you start to combine this knowledge it crosses the threshold of forgiveness because that's the only sin that's not forgiven Heaven is a blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And so I'll just uh, note a couple of points out of the, uh, the, the, uh, <clears throat> the Bhagavad Gita. It says in, in chapter 13, 22, I'm just going to read some of this stuff. Uh, the divine Atman is the divine spirit, the supreme spirit within your body if you provide access to it. Now, when you're doing a yoga ritual, you can do yoga without having uh, all of the ritual that goes with it. But once you get into that meditative yoga position, it's designed to put you in contact with this divine essence. So you'll do astral planning, you'll do all sorts of things, but you're actually interacting with this superior sort of being. And that will be invading your body 
through the beast system. And so it is uh, something that we need to be um, aware of, and we'll see many versions of this system as, as it's being developed. So it is, uh, I won't go through all the different uh, verses that would be in the uh, Vegavid, Vegav I'll get it out, the Vedas, I'll just put it that way in the up and chads. What we're seeing developed today, along with cryptocurrency, is this system that's going to it's going to intersect with uh, the divine essence and the access to this unlimited knowledge and this ability to provide you um, immortality. We have the cryptocurrency, which I said is going to be merged in, and it's built on blockchain technology, which the AI will harvest and use against you. That's why the rich will have this invisibility aspect because they'll have the have the uh, the right and the money to buy that. So this is a, a blockchain system. And in that blockchain system, nothing is erased unless you have this super crypto geomancy to prevent it. And that this is the social credit system that is used in China. So, so that if you don't hit a proper buy a house and soon you they'll take it to a level you can't go watch a movie you can't go to a sports event or a concert if you don't hit that blockchain score and you also have the Davos crews and the uh, the G20 as they met in October and in January where they want the who organization to implement a new digital passport and this passport is going to monitor where you go all the pharmacia that you've been taking or haven't been taking, uh, all your medical records as a whole, and it will also measure your carbon footprint. But which we, which we know, uh, Mr. Mayor, I just want to interrupt you, just add in, through uh, Palantir and Operation uh, Tiberius Kirk through Operation Warp Speed, uh, that was initiated during the Trump administration, right? Now, anybody who's taking said pharmacia, Okay, or anybody who's tested for COVID in a clinical setting right now, uh, both the United States, United Kingdom, and through the UN World Food Program, they are entering your past, present, and future medical history into a database, which I assume would later be used through that passport-like system. Yeah, and uh, the WHO organization along with us, so they're working on the legislation through the UN that the Biden government is supporting, is that if when the next pestilence comes along if you aren't doing an adequate job by their evaluation or by what they would like to see you do they will have the right to move in and uh, subdue local law and national law to do whatever they want to try and stomp out the uh, the pestilence so this blockchain technology uh, that we're talking about is used in china and it's the alibaba system that's used there and Google works in partnership with them there. So, and Google works with the quantum computing as a big player and the AI as a big player. Now, the Davos G20 and B20 group, they what they want to do is use the Alibaba platform. So that platform will add to that blockchain transference of knowledge that we talked about and give you them almost a, you know, worldwide basis of absolute control and the implant that system hasn't even been implemented yet and so we're going to see this continue to develop into this ultimate system that i think babylon is going to introduce and that um antichrist will uh, take over and take probably take to to another level now the other things that we need to understand as we look at these this ai that matches with with uh quantum computing and cryptocurrency is that the AI harvests all of these systems. If you want to buy something with cryptocurrency, it doesn't matter. There's lots of different things you can, and there's these top 10, 20 cryptocurrency companies in the world. Every piece of information you're putting in there, AI is already harvesting that and selling that. It's already in place. And we're going to see this on steroids. Now, if we look also um, with what's going on with the AI sort of aspect of it, just so that people um, have a better idea as to 
the language that is used in AI is, is that um, I'll begin with Elon Musk with him saying that uh, with AI, you know, we're some summoning the demons. Yeah. And he just didn't say that without having something real to go along with it. Yeah. And so daemons are algorithms as they like to use sort of a acronym. And so daemons are algorithms that actively manage the system towards specific goals. And it's all the globalist goals. And they can uh, affect things. They affect rankings. They can inter intervene to do additional things. And as AI goes, they're starting to do things that maybe they hadn't predicted that it could do. But that's, that's another rabbit hole. Gary. And so this is the system of algorithms that Google is putting on into their global operating system. And it's an intelligence that's uh, demonstrated by a, a machine, as people will say, but there's this distinct feeling that this is a, a system that is occupied by demons. And that is not actually an artificial AI, it's a real uh, spirit. So yeah. daemon is the Greek word for what we get Or disembodied spirits of the Nephilim and the Rephaim, and they need something called an Oikotarian. And what an Oikotarian is, is a dwelling place for the spirit. And that word comes from Jude 1, 6 with habitation, where the spirit angels left their dwelling place in heaven and came to earth. And if they're going to interact as a physical spirit, they want to interact physically, they need to have a physical body. So we also get another oikotarian, the word is used in 2 Corinthians 5, 2 for house in heaven. So it's a dwelling place. You get that sort of understanding in terms of the applications. And so the disembodied spirits need a dwelling place to interact in the physical world. So that's why they possess. Now, we also get the understanding through what's going on with the technology that demons are somehow able to live amongst these AI technologies that are being developed. And that starts to bring up things like talking idols. So in the Old Testament and in the King James Version, you get this term called a teraphim, which means a talking idol. It's not always directly translated as teraphim, but it may just say idol. But one example of being Mesopotamia, she took the family idols that's a teraphim idol as you take that back to hebrew and that these inanimate objects could actually talk and they would communicate with people who had this special kind of idol where a demon was possessing what's important to understand about all of that is when we get to the mark of the beast and the image of the beast we're going to have a teraphim and whether or not it's going to be demons in it ai or a combination that's all hooked into this system um it is something that we need to be very much aware of because as a fellow by the name of Marco Rinci stated, he said, and he's from the Institute of, of excuse me, <clears throat> Institute of Ethics and Energy Technologies. It says computer sciences are all applied demonology. So they are talking about it, but because Because they've named these algorithms according to gods, it's sort of, sort of, all well, it's just, you know, them naming it as, as they want, but they're not, they're just picking these names. This is very, so this is the technology that's being developed. And I'll let you in in just a second. And just so that people don't think I overlooked what else they're doing at CERN, because you can go into different dimensions with this, I think they're searching um, for the pit prison, the abyss prison. Because the abyss is in Sheol, and in Hades, or, or the other world, or whatever you want to call it, and they want to release their fallen angels that were sent there both before and after the flood, and the worst of the demons that are in the sides of the abyss, as Ezekiel 32 talks about, the terrible ones. And so I think they're trying to do that before the end time, because they're always trying to bring about the end time before the ordained time. They're frustrated with the fact that they can't, but they're trying to do that. So whether or not they actually bring this about in Revelation 9 before the midpoint of the last seven years or not, or it's actually a release by... And, and as, as permitted or authorized by God, uh, we don't know. The other thing I think they're trying to do is something that in legend, Nimrod is 
mythologized to have done. He just didn't build this tower that was supposed to go into heaven. That's physically not possible. And in the occult, whether it's pyramids or ziggurats or towers, they're all considered the same type of technology. And so the Akkadians translate Babel as Babalu versus Babel. ILU is sort of a transliteration of EL meaning a God or an angel in Hebrew. So Babel doesn't mean confusion of language in the Akkadian language, but in the Akkadian version of the Tower of Babel, it means Bab as in uh, gateway. Or portal and God. So it's a, it's a portal into another dimension. In the mythology, Nimrod said that if God ever got a line, he would go into heaven and slay God. So he wants to be, he was a classic archetypical antichrist figure with universal sway over a religion who threatened to storm heaven. The only one who stormed heaven in the past was Lucifer in Isaiah 14, which all antichrist figures down through history have tried to do. Only antichrist will be able to do that in the end time. So In Daniel 8, 10, he actually heaven in Revelation 12, where Antichrist has come to power, and he's going to throw some of the starry host down to the ground to trample on them. So they're actually going to accomplish that. So I think there's at least three things that they're trying to do at CERN. But understanding that the counterfeiting of the Holy Spirit and that they believe that the the Holy Spirit, this, this Holy Spirit counterfeit is kind of at the top of their pantheon with a sort of nebulous uh, force that created the original uh, archons or, or angels, including uh, Satan. And so we need to be aware that science is controlled by what they called themselves. And in 1662, they formed the Royal Society, which controls all education and all sciences, and even, even to this day. Um, and Francis Bacon, who's the spiritual founder for writing about the new Atlantis, this 10 king kingdom of the end time that they're trying to bring about. The Royal Society or the Invisible College, as they also like to call themselves, and probably from their, you know, closely related to the Invisible 33 um, that was sponsoring us, but Rosicrucians and Freemasons founded the Royal Society and they called themselves the last of the sorcerers and the first of the scientists. Yep. We need to understand this is all about polytheism. Science as it's being used today is not secular. It is not objective. It is a polytheist philosophy or theology of a knowledge cult that's designed to bring about the end time and destroy humans. Yeah. The Bible calls it science falsely so-called. Yep. Yep. Um, oh. That was Timothy writing to Paul. I mean, Paul writing to Timothy. Paul writing to Timothy. Yeah. I wanted to um, mention real quick too that the technology that you've been talking about that contains uh, demons. And you you also mentioned the uh, World Economic Forum earlier. This all connects. I mean, the the World Economic Forum has two different agendas that are essentially one and the same. Like they go together. So you have the New Industrial Revolution where they're trying to merge this biological, um, you know, this this biological AI stuff it, it, to merge it with human beings and then they have the internet of things where they're literally trying to build smart cities and have every single thing connected to the internet which yep. connects to the deep to the, the internet uh, blockchain of people. yeah and the internet of people and it, it connects to that blockchain you were talking about how they're going to collect <laughs> you know essentially all the data that they can possibly connect yeah and yeah, um, you you will not yeah. be able to buy or sell and the other thing that people don't know about cern is that Or the internet as we understand it today most people don't sort of understand that and uh, they have uh, observer status at the un yeah. and again Gary. i know most people don't know that they have the right to speak at general meetings they have the right to sign resolutions and vote on procedural matters and they have the right to sign signatures on working papers this is a very influential group uh, Matthew Marcel was supposed to be on with us tonight, but um, he had to take care of, I, I wasn't able to hear the message fully, so I don't know if he said his son or his wife, but one of them was sick, running a fever, but he sent a message, and 
at wanting me to ask. I know he wanted to ask a question and it's kind of off topic. So definitely don't answer, you know, too deep. Don't, you know, you don't have to answer, you know, in depth, but what he wanted to ask was and what you're asking. He, he just wanted to know um, about St. Germain. Oh, yeah. um, if uh, St. Germain um, and the, uh, what island is it? Uh, the, the temple where they think the Templars buried their treasure. They have the History Channel show. Um, Oak Island. Oak Island, yeah. Yep. He, he just wanted to know if you thought that St. Germain had a connection there with Oak Island. Well, if there is a St. Germain, then I would say yes. Um, St. Germain would be the occult version of Lazarus. Uh, I think a counterfeit of that. Um, somehow able to live on through multiple generations. And they would say, you know, you know, back maybe even before before Jesus. So somebody of that long lived nature, if true, would acquire a lot of wealth and power and be able to uh, be involved sure. on those things. So the treasure at Oak Island uh, isn't there. Uh, it, it was at one time, I think. So I listened to a high level Templar and there are actually high level Templars to this day. Um, and uh, he said that uh, the, the treasure was moved, um, you know, over a hundred years ago. And uh, it was moved to locations on uh, reserve lands for First Nations. And they did that because they 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 have a similar polytheist religion, right, to the chiefs. It's, it's uh -huh. just a different sort of branch of it. So they negotiated treaties with them. And, and so they've hidden their treasures at certain places, probably important theist worship or burial sites or something like that. But the thing is, is if you understand. moved this to several locations because of the importance of it and they couldn't take a chance at leaving it, it was there for quite a while it was the Sinclair's and the uh, um, you know Freemasonic movement that was developed um, to house some of the uh, Templar adepts that moved the the uh, treasures there uh, but they've been moved on so that's that would be my understanding and it makes for a great show they're, they're going to find some things just to keep people interested but you have to understand these they, they've been planning this whole thing for generations. And so they always had plans to keep it away from the mundane, as they would call us. That's right. us. So, um, <clears throat> Mr. Wayne, when they talk about, have you ever heard of, came across the New Agers uh, discussing, well, I guess the modern New Agers, Barbara Marks Hubbard, um, uh, what's her name? Um, <sighs> the, the Church Universal and Triumphant, I forgot. Elizabeth Claire, Claire Prophet. Uh, talking about the uh, trust of St. Germain uh, and discussing that the one world currency, which they kind of uh, uh, discuss in, in love and light terms, um, will be a, a, ba a vast based electronic uh, minerals backed, gold backed currency uh, for that those who participate uh, and what we would see as Christians as the B system, those who take the mark uh, would be able to have a limited m money supply, yeah. uh, unlimited money supply per se, so that they could uh, uh, give into their sin nature, give into their desires. Um, have you came across any of that? Because they seem to write and talk about that quite often. Yeah. Uh, and what's also interesting is Nostradamus um, wrote about uh, money that was hidden. And you have to understand when he wrote, I mean, they're talking about gold and silver and jewels when they're talking about the wealth currency of that time that would back everything. So people think that people like Elon Musk or Bill Gates are the wealthiest people in the world. That is. Yeah, they just have small paper. potatoes to yeah. the wealth that's not on the books. Yeah. And so the wealth that's on the books is significantly higher. So when I started getting into my research of secret societies somewhere around 2000 to 2002, um, it was estimated at that time from some of the sources I was talking about is that the off the books wealth was three to 600 trillion. Yeah. 
that long ago. So how much more Jeez. would that wealth be? And that was acquiring uh, the gold and the silver and the precious metals all around the world. And I out think of the they, Philippines, the Gold Warriors book and stuff like that, Marcos yeah. and taking the gold out of the Philippines. Yeah. So. so this is to be brought out according to their belief system at the time of the Messiah. So yep. that. And the 10 kings so that they have the money to go over won't have any money. And so they, they would really love to have this great reset where they bankrupt all the visible wealth which is why they're trying to get us to bankruptcy. So in that sort of global reset, which works in parallel with the globalist strategy and this technology strategy of the beast system, is okay. that everybody who has any debt would be, that would be wiped clean. Yep. Yep. And, but in return, you can't own anything. And the people who uh, own stuff and don't have debts, they're going to confiscate your money just as they did with Malta and other places in the 2008 European collapse to pay for these debts. And then you'll be just reduced like them. And current oligarchs, let's say like the visible ones like Bill Gates or Elon Musk and those people, as opposed to the invisible ones that are behind the scenes with all the wealth, they'll lose all of their money too, but they'll be guaranteed, yeah, guaranteed. to be part of the oligarch. And they'll make that money back quickly. So yeah. They're, they are, I mean, what a scheme. diabolically um, inclined and. And it's happening now. And continually to push to, uh, you know, put them to a position to, I think, absolutely reinstall the four class system or the feudal system that used to be, where yeah. you would have two very powerful classes of the royal elite and the warrior elite and, the, and then the priest elite. And then below that is you would have a very small class of to use old terms, blacksmiths, bakers, tailors, who very barely scratch out a living, and then you have the slave and working class. That's the system they want to reimpose. Now, where does D-Wave no come middle in? Class. There, it's a war on the middle class, absolutely. Yeah, where does D-Wave come into all of this? Because I remember, you know, while we were talking about the technology, the uh, creator of D-Wave yeah. um, had mentioned something about uh, finding dimensions or unleashing yeah. an entity Somewhere so D, those D-Wave works in conjunction with AI, at least that's what it was designed to do, uh -huh. and in conjunction with quantum so that they can do multiple searches in multiple dimensions. You guys still there? Yes. Yeah, okay. yeah uh, um, we can hear you. Okay, good. So I you think... Were... Yeah, so I think that that D wave is just sort of been absorbed into it, so it doesn't have that high profile nature. Yeah. It sort of slid back into uh, the, uh, I guess, the hyper development of AI. And one of the other things about AI that I was just sort of struck my mind is that a lot of people working in the development of AI, they say they're in contact with spirit beings of some sort. Yeah. Um, and uh, one name that comes up is Metatron. Um, and Meta oh, yes. is part of the metaverse. Meta is in a social, they, they like to use those sort of terminologies. And Metatron okay. is an interesting character if you're not familiar the with him. Third he Enoch. Is, uh, the third, yeah, third Enoch. He is Enoch, yeah. son of Cain, because that's a very much corrupted book that uh -huh. was created, that was promoted to uh, God status or angelic status because of his knowledge. He's like Thoth of Egypt um, and the God of wisdom. So that's apparently who they're talking to in part. Very strong in Jewish mysticism and Kabbalah. Yeah, Kabbalah. yeah, yeah. Met Met Metatron is, is very much uh, invoked uh, within Jewish mysticism. Uh, and theosophy. So yeah, there's true theosophy too as well. Yes, I mean Elizabeth Clare Prophet used to channel Metatron. Yep. Um, so I mean that that's not that's very interesting, um, but that's not surprising. You know, another thing that uh, is going on with CERN and their influence on the world in similar locations, I understand Google's in there big time along with some other key oligarchical um, high-tech companies, but they, they develop things, um, partner with companies to put that technology into the market and they take an ongoing licensing uh, agreement with that. And there's no real transparency as to where all of that money goes so they're driving the pace 
And again, what they're trying to do is they're trying to bring about the end time before it's ordained timed. And one of the uh, uh, groups that they've developed for this development of the knowledge and technology is called the KTs. Well, the KTs is the term that's used in the craft for the Knights Templar and the rituals. I mean, you just you just can't make this stuff up. The truth is stranger than fiction, for sure. Did we lose them this time? Uh, their allegory that they're trying to bring back, right? I mean, it's just absolutely crazy with the with how they just get right out there with their imagery, just like with the dance of Shiva, and the Shiva being the destroyer god, which is likely Abaddon and Apollyon or Zazel, and that's who they're trying to get out of the abyss. I mean, they just continually paint their belief system over everything that they're doing and 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 yet most people are just they just pass it off as well oh, it's kind of weird but so what yeah because the brush they're using is secular secularism you know what i mean like they think that anything yeah. that's outside of religion is secular but yep. really they're speaking in symbols and all these subliminal ways and if you look into it you can clearly see you know that there is an occult agenda there's definitely a polytheistic um, mindset behind all the things that they're doing you just got to look. Yep. Yeah, it is. And it's, uh, I think that uh, I find it interesting that there's been a halt on or an attempt to halt on the development of AI um, because of, uh, you know, it's a, got that existential <laughs> sort of risk attached to it. But right. uh, we all know how this ends. Um this is crazy. Uh, and the genie, so to speak, again, to use their terms, is out of the bottle or out of the lamp. And uh, uh, China's developing this as well. And now it's into this race of, you know, good versus evil, but they're both evil that are developing this. It's the same coin. And uh, there's no lesser, the, there's no lesser of the two evils here. There's no, you know, I yeah. mean, when Elon Musk is talking about making Twitter the WeChat of yeah. America and implementing yeah. the same social credit score system and artificial yeah. intelligence. And, yeah. you know, he comes out last week and he was like, yeah, we're going to make it a financial platform to rival the yeah. banks. And you're yeah. like, yeah, I don't want any part of this. <laughs> yeah. You know, so. Yeah. They, you know, they, there's this um, propaganda that's out there. It's part of the polytheist belief system, but they call themselves the white hats and the black hats. Yep. And we might understand that in other terms as black magic and white magic as, as they like to look at it or a right. good witch or an evil witch or a good Nephilim or a bad Nephilim and that the white hats have humankind's interest at heart. Well, they don't. They have the same goal. They just have a different route to get there, and they still yep. worship the same pantheon of gods, and it's still the same vengeance that those pantheon of gods swore to destroy humankind and prevent us from becoming, uh, being resurrected and being angel-like, so to speak, or to be in, in the future world. So there's no white hat that's going to help us. This is just uh, a different uh, route to the same destination. Within yeah, we God, call this within... a false light awakening. Yeah, within God, there is no darkness. The, the false great awakening, the great reset pivoting to the great awakening that the white yeah. hats are going to save us. But yeah. when you have white hats like Elon Musk, it's like, no, 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 this is not, both is not good. It's Especially when they're both saying the same things, right? Yeah. But they, when, but again, you know, when the, the, the New Agers through the great awakening are to say, oh, yeah, you're going to have um, – uh, money uh, from the St. Germain Trust where you'll be able to do whatever you want. You have your intention binders or your or your Tesla bed so you can live forever yeah. and be healed through nanobots and everything yeah. like that. I mean, you know, they just try to spin it with this love and light veneer yeah. of we're going to save you, right? When our only yeah. savior is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But that's what they try to push. So it's the white, it's the white, uh, it's the white tile from the checkered floor. You know what I mean? Yep. Yep. It's, uh, it's that same allegory. Absolutely. It's, you know, it, it's a dualistic religion of good versus evil. That is always in perpetual conflict. They have a macro and a micro. The macro is Satan versus the God of the Bible. They would include Satan as being equal and they're going to be at odds forever. And within the system, within the belief system, they have the same thing, but they're all worshiping the same pantheon of gods. It's Star Wars. It's the same allegory there. How do you see AI tying into the image of the beast? 
Well, it's it's going to be one of the key operating things. And, and again, I think it may have that sort of demonic sort of essence as that teraphim. And I think it's going to be, you know, working through that divine essence as well. I think it's all sort of coming together. What's also interesting as you sort of tie that ability to control all buying or selling or for all people who refuse the mark or to worship, it's going to have that much worldwide access to information and control can cause anybody who doesn't take the mark or worship Satan or worship Antichrist to be beheaded. So it's going to be all powerful, but not objective. It's going to be working in that biased left-wing polytheist fascism of uh, the global estate that they're going to bring about that antichrist is going to take over and it will be working for antichrist what's also interesting is that false prophet receives the power from the dragon just as antichrist and that's the one who creates the image of the beast and by the time of armageddon you have demons that come out of the mouth of false prophet and antichrist um, that are going to gather the and kings the and the armies for war and do great miracles now does that mean that that's actually what's going to happen or you could also translate that line in greek in in the new testament of of the demons that come out of the antichrist and false prophet's mouth as commanding with their mouth the demons to do this and that antichrist and false prophet will be commanding those demons as well so it's probably a both not just an and or an or but a both uh, with the demons within the image of the mark and the demons that will be possessing whatever bodies as oiketarians that they're received at that time uh, in the end time and if we look at diablos which is the uh, word for devil as opposed to the devil with the evil and unclean spirits that jesus uh, is exercising those demon spirits out those devils in those passages goes back to damon the word that we talked about uh, previously but diabolos is the specific word for satan which you know we get the usual meanings but he's also the leader and the prince of the angels of the fallen angels and of the demons so false prophet and antichrist will receive the power of the dragon and of the empire that's handed yeah. to them yeah. uh, and will command those demons accordingly with complete authorization now they say that um you know, the, there's some prophecy in the Bible that talks about the giants returning and says we're on the subject of, you know, technology. I just listened to something Laura Sanger said, said the other day about mRNA um, technology that is able to activate um, dormant genes within people. And she was getting into how, um, you know, there's multiple different uh, ways to interpret how the giants came back after the flood, whether it was in the genetics or second incursion, what have you. Um, Maybe this isn't a question, but I just want to throw my theory out there. What if M N M N M N A R? What is it called? mRNA. MRNA. Messenger RNA. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know that technology is used to activate these dormant genes, maybe Nephilim genes that are in some people um, in the end times to to reactivate those, and that's how the giants come back. I don't know. Well, I'm just well, if, it out you, there. if 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 you look at what the uh, Nazi belief was with that Superman um, that they wanted to create. Um, I mean, they were trying to do it going forward through, you know, sort of genetics and intermarrying to create the Aryan race from Thule, which is right. either um, the Norse version of Atlantis, um, or it is Atlantis because those were run by giants in their belief system. But they also felt that they could backwards engineer the blood and the genes to recreate that giant race somehow some way and they were receiving because they were all adepts of polytheism uh secret societies and the rice church which is just another polytheist uh, church that was formed in 1933 uh, that reduced jesus to a blonde-haired blue-eyed mortal prophet um and Hitler as an antichrist type figure, they were trying to do that. And I think that's a good analogy for the end time. So mRNA technology is technically like a digital technology in a very primitive form at this point that it can send messages to the genes. So you can improve that technology and you can do that. So they'll probably be doing part of that and that will transition into that implant chip digital technology down the road and even transcend beyond the genes beyond the DNA, but right back down to the quantum level and the building blocks of life through all that information to, to reorganize that. So 
we may see, I think, uh, before they hit the ultimate level by the time of Antichrist, they'll we'll be seeing mRNA technology doing similar kinds of things, knowingly or unknowingly, but it will transition into that digital technology, I think. Yeah, the reverse engineering of those things, uh, it, it you know goes back to some of the theories of why we went into Afghanistan and finding the tomb of, tomb of Osiris and yep. well, and, and another thing to keep in mind is is that they are looking for specific genes because it's not the Rh negative blood that's a manifestation of the gene. Um, so they they believe in what they call the gene of ISIS. They believe in the LB gens, the Julia gens, the fairy gens, and they're looking for that. So if you wanted to reignite that, that's what you would do with that mRNA tech mRNA technology to stimulate that to do what the Nazis were trying to do by mm-hmm. um, recreating uh, the giants of 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 Thule. Yeah. Um... Uh, one interesting thing, Barb Marks Hubbard wrote uh, Happy Birthday, Planet Earth. It was like a short pamphlet of hers um, in the uh, 1980s. And she talks about here, she goes, if the selfish, which, you know, her being elitist is like the common person, or you could even say, go a step further and say Christians, um, who she absolutely hates. But um, she, she mentions if the selfish would inherit the evolutionary capacities, early external aspects of Christ's ability, nuclear energy, biotechnology, longevity, self-replicating machines, and the power to build new worlds, they would self-destruct in the process, destroy the whole. Why do the selfish exist at all? We are not all children of God ready to graduate to being heirs of God. The answer is freedom. We're endowed by our creator with one basic inalienable right, the freedom to follow the will of God or to ignore it and become extinct. And then later on, she talks about a tribulation will increase in selection, uh, the, the selection process, which she said the selection process is elites killing off one fourth of humanity. Okay, that's what she said. God, you know, God creates, we destroy for him. Okay, as, yep. as the horsemen of the apocalypse. Sorry, yep. she, she stated that. She goes, um, We'll, we'll discriminate with either fi- greater refinement until the final selection is made in the stage of Earth's evolution. Jesus told you to prepare at all times for you n- know not when the quantum instant will come. Then she falsely quotes Matthew 24, 37, 42 about the in the days of Noah and then pivots later and discusses messenger RNA as having a spiritual implication. Now, this was in the early 80s, okay, yeah. and how it has a spiritual implication to change people and to make them evolve and co-create with God to mm-hmm. elevate them to godlike status in the early 1980s. Yeah, so that, that just tells you they were aware of the technology that they were trying to develop. They just weren't there yet. And the ability to test it through pestilence, contrive pestilences, is a was an enormous opportunity for them to see how far they had come along and how easily could they sort of distribute that through the medical uh, system. And so, as I mentioned, the the the, uh, the Davos and the G20 and the B20 group, they, they imagine that this delivery system will be demanded and will be delivered through the healthcare system. So... I think you start starting to see that kind kind of emergence with it. And those groups all answer into the committee of 300. Yeah. Yeah. And then you have Peter Thiel financing a lot of the longevity research um, uh, that's going on currently. Uh, and it's very interesting to see that. I mean, they're all, they want to believe that they can escape God's judgment, that they can escape death so they don't have to uh, face the second death. Um, And that is false, obviously, as we well know, Uh, but they're going to do their darndest to try. Well, Uh, well, they they, they believe that they have that immortal spirit, that counterfeit spirit. So they need to create ways that they can stay in the physical universe and not suffer the the first death and then the second death, right? Uh, Trouble is, is... God trumps that at the end of the, you know, the end at the end of this age and the end time at Armageddon that they're going there anyways. Yeah. yeah. Um, but they think that they can actually win their own realm still. That's what, but they're being told that by their gods and the gods already know the angels, the fallen angels, they already knew that after Jesus rose from the grave, something they didn't anticipate. And that he actually, I think actually went to speak to them as, as the book of, of Peter talks about um, that, you you know when he jesus rises on the sunday that their rebellion is kind of officially over and yeah. the adamite resolution to the angelic uh rebellion is in effect they will be resurrected and you will go to the lake of fire yeah yeah i've had people try to um argue with me that and they think that 
Satan and the fallen angels and demons actually believe that they can win this war um, based on things that L. Ron Hubbard and others have said. Yep. And I told them that that that's impossible, that they they convince humans of these lies. But the Bible tells us clearly in Revelation 12 yep. that the devil knows that his time is short. Yeah. And I think I think uh, you know they they were intimate with God. They were created immortal, intimate with God. And they know how powerful God is. Absolutely. And yeah. so they knew they could never win. And that's why the language in Isaiah 14 is so important to understand that Satan wanted to raise his throne to be heaven to be like God, not yeah. to overthrow him because he knew he could not. And not to replace them because he knew he could not. He wanted to be like God. And that's what all Antichrist figures are trying to do as well, because of course they're, you know, loyal to 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 Satan. But the important thing is is that when you look at the language and the entertainment and the goals of polytheists is that they're not looking and i think that movie those movies particularly the first one with dr strange really higher really highlighted that they're not looking to overthrow what they would call the dark lord of the universe yeah they just want to have earth as a negotiated sort of island where they can live on their own without god's oversight so yeah. they never thought they could win they thought that they could create enough chaos and uh doubt but amongst the angelic realm that they could have their own place and then when god created adam he knew what that was going to mean and yeah. thus the revenges that he has continued all the way through to wipe humans from the face of the earth and ensure that we don't reach that destiny including offering jesus all the world's empires at the time and also having trying to have jesus killed yeah. all the yeah. time not realizing that when they finally did kill him that was the ultimate thing that they couldn't do if they were going to win their own realm. Yeah. And, and I mean, yeah. Barbara, I mean, Barbara Marks Hubbard, they, all the, the modern day new age theosophists that all channel these demons and these lesser gods, um, they all, that's what they all say is they're either going to try their best to make it here on, on earth and some utopia where they can live as gods and co-create and survive in that method, or they're going to go in space and try it, which is completely yeah. ludicrous in my opinion. Yeah. And then, you know, you see through Babylon working with L. Ron Hubbard, and Parsons, uh, how they were trying to bring up upon the earth a scarlet woman. And during that same period, which Lucifer's Technologies, which was written by, uh, I can't think of the guy's name right now, maybe uh, Christopher Knowles, that right after Babylon working, literally the year later, you have the uh, transitions from capacitors to modern day transistors starting the, tech, you know, the modern technological revolution. And so you have, like you're, you've been talking about this whole time, uh, excellently um gary and everything you've been saying is a lot which a lot of people don't realize is a lot of these scientists and a lot of these quantum mechanics um believers um there's a sort there's there's a major mysticism uh uh within them i mean you had wolfgang Pauli directly writing letters with um carl jung who was a known gnostic yep. and, and, and mystic uh and kind of uh, formulating his theories of quantum mechanics and theoretical physics directly with young and young's interpreting dreams he's having interpret yep. you know and they're working together like directly yep. uh together on this um and you have Edward Teller, the the, the founder of the uh, atomic bomb uh you know um I mean they were all not all, I would say all of them, but majority of them were, they were in, like polytheist. you said, like a, yeah, they're polytheist and they, and they're working in kind of like this, what we call modern day, which I would say would be kind of like this mystery Babylon religion, yep. you know, uh, yep. type theosophy, uh, yep. theosophy in, in the modern age. Yep. Uh, but it's all just, you know, um, the, the, the belief system of Satan uh, from when yep. Satan distorted God's word to Eve, right. You could know, eat this, the tree yep. of the knowledge would be of good evil and you'll be like God. Um, and so, and, and so because of that, that, has and you could actually even trace it back to the, the all the origins of science. Yep. I mean, let's be real here, and you've discussed that too as well. Yeah. But at least, at least in the modern time, they it's it, if anybody looks, you it's there, it's definitely yep. there. You can look and see it. So, well, and it's the same things that they did when they when Enoch, son of Cain, separated the knowledge into seven sacred sciences, as, as they call them. It's the same as the seven liberal arts today, but their goals were four. And so Gary, it was Jeremy's got to Jeremy I was, Stone has got to leave. And okay. I know he wanted to ask you a question before he left. 
Okay, I'll just quickly get the four things out. We'll go to Jeremy if he's got time for that. So the four things that they try and do is one, to uh, dismiss God as if he's not important or uh, not there at all. Degrade God or slander God, which they do in science. They also uh, want to lead people away from God. So anything in the discussion other than, you know, creationism or anything like that, that might reflect on God. And then the fourth thing is, is to honor their pantheon of God. So they name everything after their gods and their demigods or demons yeah. and everything and all the buildings and the degrees. It's all about honoring that whole system. We see that still today. It's the same core things that they're trying to do today, which is why it's like the days of Noah. And now we're getting yeah. that technology there. So yes, get in there, Jeremy, before you go, it's probably going to be a the best question of the show, I think. <laughs> Thanks. Um, well, yeah, I just wanted to agree with you because, you know, they're naming, they named all the planets, they, they named yeah. space shuttles and all these other things after gods and stuff, and especially like some of their agendas, they also name after these ancient yep. gods. But um, you mentioned earlier how, um, you know, these scientists are getting information uh, about quantum physics from entities. And I was listening to uh, the confessionals the other night, and this guy was talking about how he went, er, he learned how to astral project and when he did that, an entity showed him, and this wasn't even on the topic of what they were talking about. It was just, he was just kind of saying his experience, but um, this entity showed him supposedly the fabric of space and time in the universe. And it was like the matrix. It was like green coded letters and all this stuff. Um, and I know that the matrix in itself, that whole uh, ideology, I guess, comes from Gnosticism. Can you just break down what the, the view of the matrix is and what, you know, how that relates to Gnosticism and quantum mechanics. Yeah. yeah. So it's basically all imagery from Gnosticism where they believe the world is this projection, right? And that the gods and the demigods that would run this projection uh, require the power of the spirit. And that's why they need you to worship the power of that and, and to sacrifice uh, humans as well. They would get additional power of that. So this is when you look at the Matrix movie, that's what you're seeing is this projection as they would see it in, in allegorical form of polytheism and that characters like uh, Neo, um, which is, you know, sort of an anagram as the one this different format. Again, that that comes out of mythology as after the God, all of the characters are sort of talked about in terms of demigod and god characters and so you have and of course the one would be like a magianic figure it's like a um, dragon messiah with uh, the programs for the matrix as being like the angels loyal to god um, and of course the uh, creator of the uh, matrix is the great architect so this is again classic inverse turn it inside and out and you know, place uh, as the evil God as the architect that made this this uh, matrix and that his angels are keeping people in prison, but it's actually what they want to do. Um, Morpheus comes out of Greek mythology as well as one of those gods who invades dreams. <laughs> um, so again, I won't go on on all, all, of, the, all of the details, but the, the Messiah is trying to save... Um, humanity from this evil god who created the matrix but because it's a dualistic belief system that it never really gets completed it just happens over and over and over and over and you get this perpetual good versus evil that's why they have all of these messiah or the ones that come along every so often that sort of start the cycle all over again but never really win um, so it's, uh, you know, and Trinity is sort of that sort of aspect of she's part of the Trinity, right? Yeah. Uh, with with uh, Neo being the sun. And right. so then you have this nebulous um, male God uh, that works with uh, Trinity through the sun. And that is the same sort of convoluted mythos that comes out of Osiris and Isis and Horus in Greek mythology. So it's just everything about it is showing their belief system. You even have these ancient programs called the Merovingians in there. Yeah. I mean, they just load all, of, you got these spirit, uh, um, like the place they demon live spirits is Zion. that are working with the Merovingians. It's just over and over and over. It's their belief system, and they're just preparing people for the lies that they're going to bring about in significant ways, and not just in an entertainment, but in our everyday life in the not so distant future.
Yeah, now one of the brothers is a uh, is a chick now, so that's the dangers yeah, of narcissism for you. The <laughs> sisters, um, you know, a, a great thing to watch on that and on um, what Gary was pointing out as far as the Marvel movies and Doctor Strange, uh, we ha- actually have both on the the network and that and their Good Fight Ministries documentaries. You've got uh, Hollywood's War on God that shows the Gnostic origins of the Matrix movies and others. And like, uh, it also shows the the Gnostic origins of the uh, Dan Brown books that were eventually movies. And then the the newest one is the one, uh, Jeremy, you and I actually watched together. Uh, It's um, Marvel and DC's War on God part two. And it's the um, the multiverse of the multiverse of Satanism or something like that. But it, it literally shows just how because you've got these. First of all, Doctor Strange is created after Alistair Crowley. Um, he's created in the image of Crowley, but you know he's not a scientist in the way we would think today he's a sorcerer but everything in the movie is a mix of sorcery and science with you know quantum mechanics and the multiverse and all of that yep but they're both great documentaries that really explain yeah how it's all yeah that it's all about their belief system and and again, it's amazing how well they do these things. They have a great system for producing people who can write and communicate and tell great entertainment. But they've got a long history of this. I mean, the Greek classics is the same type of literary MO. Shakespeare is another similar kind of product coming through the Spear Shaker Society in the Helmet Society, next to the Helmet Society that was uh, created and run by Francis Bacon, the Rosicrucian, to create the English language for, uh, to be the universal language as he sort of thought through the, that he thought the British Commonwealth might become that world empire in in the end time. And of course, King James, the great Prince King James, the the Gaburim Prince James, as, you know, the writer of demonology in three parts, um, is you know, thought of himself in in those sort of unicorn uh, traditions. And then you have down, you know, even into the 1930s and 40s, you have the Inkling Society at Oxford that trained and wrote um, Tolkien and Lewis. And they're in a branch of the Golden Dawn Society, which is Rosicrucian, that they ought not to be in because they don't show any sort of visible signs of being Masons, not that Freemasonry in the, in the United Kingdom releases the records, but they were obviously young when they're at Oxford University. The only way they could be there is their bloodline because they'd be initiated from childhood. So they would have been adept beforehand because even first level adept in Freemasonry isn't going to get into a Rosicrucian society. You have to go up the degree system to be able to get in there. So they were there just to be, to sort of work on their craft of the writing so that they could create Lord of the Rings and the Narnia tales and put all of their belief systems in that and their history yeah and you can see that very well in um tolkien's book about uh middle earth um yeah exactly trying to think of the what's the name of it i actually have it and i have an audio version as well before i knew just how steep into the occult it was i had it up on my youtube channel but um (laughs) it it shows how the the Middle Earth, you know, all the all the the characters and the realms of the Hobbit and Lord of the Rings books are, you know, he basically created, and I don't think he did it on his own. He created, you know, a language, uh, you know, a mythology yep. uh, with. A pantheon of gods and basically like the gnostic god you have the highest god and then you have the lower ones under them and then lower ones under them and 
uh, I would say that Sauron pro probably represents uh, Yaldabaoth um, or what the Gnostics believe is the God of the Old Testament. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, and it, and it's brilliant work. Um, his bloodlines actually go back to Norse. Yeah. And uh, and I have a great document on that, on the writings and both Lewis's and and uh, Tolkien's bloodlines. And uh, yeah, he uh, I mean he he wrote an antediluvian story. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and you know he based it on Norse version of the fairy mythology, as opposed to the the Celtic. Uh, a version similar but there are obviously different things that show up and the giants show up as the white elves as opposed to the dark elves which are the little ones and you know the dwarves are the ones who made all of the weapons for the demigods and yep. they lived in the earth and they're shown with their manufacturing plants in the mountains in the earth uh, it just goes on and on and on and on and that white the hair those, those were... white those pale skin elves those noble elves of the elven bloodline of the tuatha de danan the fairy elves the mm -hmm. shays the writers of the shay yeah, uh, you talk about in your book. yeah they are identical they're just not shown quite as tall but you know they have those that blonde hair blue-eyed pale skin and that's the norse version versus the red hair hazel-eyed pale skin of ireland and wales and scotland um Gary, I have a question. Um, have you came across the modern kind of um, quantum mechanic uh, uh, magic, without a better words, um, group, uh, the Institute of Noetic Sciences by chance? Does that ring a bell? No, I'm not familiar with them. Okay, I've done a lot of research into them um, because they were actually what was referenced in Dan Brown's book, The Lost Symbol, uh, oh, right. as yep. the good guys with the Masons. So in that yes. book, Dan Brown both makes the Masons and the Institute of Noetic Sciences the heroes. Yes. Okay. And so um, when the I, you know, hats. when I. Um, when I became born again afterwards, I went back because I used to uh, greatly respect Dan Brown as a Gnostic. Yeah. Um, I went back and tried to say, okay, so the Institute of Noetic Science is real. And so I looked it up, and yeah, it was. It was founded in the 1970s by both Edgar Mitchell, who's a big New Age astronaut, and Paul Nathaniel Temple Jr. Now, the interesting thing about Paul Nathaniel Temple Jr. is he was a uh, financier to the family or the, the family and the fellowship, um, which is kind of like this... I want to say almost mystical uh, pseudo Christian group that was founded by Abraham Variety, um, which still uh, exists to this day and kind of like uh, high echelons of power on kind of like the conservative side. Um, and um, so it was very interesting to find out that, you know, the Templeton Fund, which also funds many conservative quote unquote uh, groups. I remember used to watching the McLaughlin group with my grandfather yep. when I was yep. growing up. And I love that group too. Yep. Funded, funded, funded <laughs> by the Templeton Fund. Uh, yep. You know, so yep. it's interesting to see that this so-called, you know, conservative, you know, Christian organization is funding this major new age organization now yep. that's, that's getting people to send their 23andme data so they can yep. find psychic genes is pushing psychedelics very strongly to the population they're going around to these conspiracy conferences and sending various members of the institute of Atlantic sciences to propagate new age beliefs and bar marx hubbard was a, you know spoken was a member of the institute of Atlantic sciences herself among many other people uh and so i just didn't know if you had come across them because they seem to be one of the major uh pushes of quantum mechanics or yep. the institute of Atlantic, uh, um, or, or um new age beliefs in, in modern Modern times so i just yeah. didn't know if you had to come across them or not no i didn't but i recognize the name now that you mentioned it from the dan brown book i mean and dan brown i mean he wrote fiction but everything that he wrote yep. about was what they believed yep 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 so it's yes it's fiction but it really isn't right and so and it's not uncommon it is part of the strategy and the tactics to invade christianity and seed in beliefs and doubts and, and, and that's what they tend to do. I need to take a one minute break here. Okay. Um, that's fine. Go ahead. Dan go ahead. Brown's yeah. books actually remind me of like a Gnostic version of um, the, the Christian books, the, the um, Chronicles of the Nephilim and the Chronicles of the Watchers by... Um, Oh, my mind just went completely blank. <sighs> He's they're my favorite books ever. Um, and he's actually been on with me. Um, 
he do you know who i'm talking about who wrote the books i know um, i looked it up it's chronicles of the watchers would be author brian yeah Godwin? brian Godawa. Godawa, brian yeah. Godawa. um trust me they are the chronicles of the nephilim um actually are it's a it's a longer set and it's it, it, it's older than the chronicles of the watchers but the chronicles of the nephilim are the best books fiction or otherwise that i've ever read um when i started the series i i really couldn't stop i couldn't put them down and i've listened i've got them on audible i've listened to the books every one of them two or three times um and you know the the first book is the noah book and then he wrote the enoch book but they were all written by the time I found out about them in 2018. So I actually started with the Enoch book, even though it, because he wrote it as a prequel, it was the second book, but you know, the story actually is before Noah. So I read it first and then read the Noah one, but those were the books that I was recommending, um, you guys listened to in the chat the other night but it goes from Enoch is well Noah's the first one but it goes from Enoch all the way down to Jesus Jesus triumphant is the last one in that series and they are they're fiction books but they are written um biblically and based in fact you know, he takes a little bit of um, poetic license, but not in a way that would change the biblical narrative, especially in the Jesus Triumphant book. Yeah, I mean, I, um, I, I find that, you know, interesting that, I mean, it, you know, I, me as, as a former New Ager, um, to see how, um, you know, Dan Brown's works were propagated to the masses, just like the matrix that you guys were talking about earlier to initiate people um, mm -hmm. into new age, theosophical mystery, Babylon beliefs. Um, and I mean, you know, something to go back to what you said earlier, Gary, was we have Alice Bailey literally writing in the externalization of the hierarchy, which I'm yes. reading right now, um, pretty much about how for them, they, you know, they couldn't, they couldn't stop the gospel being spread. OK, and so, you know, going to war with Christians and persecuting Christians and killing them wasn't quite working the, the way that they wanted it to. to. OK, now I know that will happen, you know, in the future, you know, during the tribulation. But at the, the, the time, they, they kind of pivoted here recently in the past 100 or so years where Alice Bailey talks about how what they need to do is infiltrate the infiltrate the church. And in doing so, they can they can can almost rise out an emerging counterfeit church. OK, and they, did. And, and they did. They did. Yes. And we're seeing the fruit of that now, just like we're seeing out of conservatism, too, as well. And I mean, I myself have conservative beliefs, obviously, as a conservative Christian. But you, you, you start wondering, why are all these conservatives and why are all these so-called Christians yoking with the world? Why are they yoking yeah. with Mormons? Why are they yoking with Muslims? Why are they yoking with um, Judaizers or people that practice Kabbalah or Jewish mystics? You know, why are they yoking with theosophists and New Agers? But time and time again, the more that you look, they're doing that, and you're seeing that a lot now with the Christian nationalist push of post-millennialists, where they're yoking with whomever they want to try to bring Christendom back, you know, in America. And it's and it, and, it, and it's disturbing to see because this is what Alice Bailey wrote about when she was channeling demons. This is what she wrote about in the 20s and the 30s, and this is what's happening today. And it is and definitely mirroring exactly back. what was prophecy in the Bible. So and you can't bring something back that was never there to begin with either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and they've been wildly successful. I mean, just think about a specific generation that they had to get ready for. Yeah. Um, the fig tree generation, as we would understand it. Uh -huh. And could one even imagine, you know, shortly after Christianity's on the rise, that there would be a time when our churches, when we need them the most, our leaders, do not teach prehistory and do not teach prophecy. Yep. Yep. The only way you can get to that point is completely inf infiltrate the churches, infiltrate the seminary schools, and forbid the ministers from teaching that. Well, so eschat that, eschatology doesn't matter 
to these people because yeah, no. it's already been fulfilled uh, for the most part. Yeah, so. and, and yet, or or even the elect will be deceived because we aren't going to be yeah. here. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, you're right, Gary. I mean, that's and I mean, Alice Bailey wrote that this is what was going to happen. Yeah. The Bible's through prophecy says this is what's going to yeah. happen, and people still just either through their own arrogancy or there are many wolves within the church. Yep. That just, you know, the people are deceived. They don't see it. I hope they eventually do. And mm -hmm. the people that are wolves, obviously, we should pray for them. Uh, but, it, you know, if they, unless they repent and believe, yep. you know, they chose to serve Satan. And yep. we're seeing this now. And it comes from exactly what we discussed this evening, which is we see it in the, you know, many throughout, you know, the history of the church an allegorical mystical interpretation of yeah. the scriptures, which the Gnostics did in of themselves too, yes. which is literally causing the end times to play out as we're seeing right now. Yeah. I mean, I've been, I was surprised that there was so much, so many Christians that bought into the interpretive approach. Um, and it, it just allows them to redefine anything in the Bible, you know, just yeah. as Tolkien and Lewis called their fairy tale writing, uh, had to have a happy ever ending, which was a eucatastrophe, as they called it, as they coined it. That's where the hero who did suffer the ultimate fate of dying was given a happy ever after ending so that the story would end on a pleasant note. And why they call the Bible a fairy tale, because in their belief system, Jesus was not resurrected. So that's the eucatastrophe part. And that you have to be an adept to understand the allegories and the mysteries that are embedded in the story to get the real meaning. So this interpretive approach has absolutely been a virus. Uh, and you have people recreating scripture in every sort of manner. Yeah. You couldn't create a better way than to take their interpretive system that's all about allegory and symbols and things like that that they keep away from the lower levels into Christianity and lead people into a state of blindness for what's coming. And they're going to be more easily roping in significant swaths of Christians into the universal Babylon religion mm -hmm. that will be coming. And they, and they will be deceived. And people will say, well, no, my faith is going to be good enough. But your faith is going to lead you to believe in somebody who is not Jesus and is going to get you to do rituals and idolatries and all sorts of horrible things, even before Antichrist were to get here, if you're still alive by that point. Amen, Gary. Yeah, I mean, I, I yeah, I, that we're seeing that unfold, right? I mean, Alice Bailey said that it was going to start, the externalization of the hierarchy was going to start in 2025. Now, I'm not saying what she said is gospel, that's exactly when it begins, but it's interesting that she chose that date so very yeah. long ago by channeling demons, and maybe that's the date that it happens, that they believe it's going to happen. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying for sure it is, it could be, you know, they could have been delayed. It's all up to God. It's not up to Satan. It's not up to the demons, okay? It's not up to the world elite, but we're seeing it. It looks like it's unfolding right now, and many Christians are like, especially in the post-millennial camp, oh, we're, we're going to, you know, make Christ's kingdom and present it to himself, which is say people in NAR and Joel's army people are saying, because they're doing allegorical uh, interpretation of the end times, and and they're like, well, uh, things are going to get better. We're going to make things better, and I'm like, what have things been better? What have things been better? Yeah, it's like You're, trying to polish a turd. I'm yeah. Excuse me, but it is. Here's the problem with the eschatology in the Christian perspective. It has been a victim of the same approach, in my opinion. And so you have all of these sort of labels for what are you if, when you study prophecy? Where do you fall into? And uh -huh. it's a preconceived conclusion that is deriving uh, what group that is in. And it drives people to do two things. Um, it drives people to leave out inconvenient passages. Yep. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is, is to reimagine, redefine, reinterpret, allegorically reinvent uh, prophecy to fit your preconceived conclusion. Jesus provided us a very simple template. We don't need to do that. We, he gave That's us right. an exact order. Yep. And uh, I can go into detail. I won't right now, but I could uh, in terms of how we know it's a chronological order and the words that he provided to us. And you just put all prophecy around what he said. It's that simple. And yeah. you'll get no conflicts. Yeah, absolutely. 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 You got to go back to the simple words of Christ. This is why Jesus said that we must come into the kingdom like little children. Yes. You know, you cannot depend on your own intellect and you know man's the, the the 
wisest man in the world is a fool compared to God. Yeah, the wisdom of this world is a deception. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Gary, before we uh, close out, because we were aiming to keep it in an hour and a half, which <laughs> we've gone <laughs> over, but that's okay. But before we do start to close out, do you want to um, tell people where they can find your work, where they can find your yes. book, and sure. if you're working on anything new? Sure. Or yep. Yeah, thank you for that opportunity. Um, so for anybody who lives in the Atlanta area, next weekend, I'm down in Atlanta at the Sacred Word World Revealed Prophecy Conference, and I'll be talking Saturday and the Sunday. Uh, the first day is on some terminologies of things in the book of Revelation and explain that so you can have a better understanding and and then the second day I go through Revelation chronology and place that around what Jesus said and show you how that works so that you can um, get a better grasp on end time prophecy. And if people are wanting to get a hold of me, the best place to get a hold of me is through my website. And that's the Genesis 6 conspiracy at uh, Genesis6conspiracy.com, the number 6conspiracy.com. And on that website, I have a generous excerpt of all 98 chapters on my book. And if you wanted to buy a copy, you can get a signed copy by going to the Buy Now page and getting a signed copy. And if you live in the U.S., there's a U.S. page. If you live in Canada, there's a Canada page. If, they're, if you're overseas, I have an overseas page. If you wanted to link over to the Kindle version, whether it's on the front of the website or on the buy page, you can link over to Kindle, get the digital version. You can also link directly over from the website over to amazon.com, amazon.ca, and barnesandnoble.com. And for the most part, you'll have to wait about probably a week. Uh, it's been oversold for at least a week and a half and the publisher's scrambling to catch up again. There's been a nice little run apparently on, on the books. On the website, I will also be marketing my new book called The Genesis a Six Conspiracy Part Two, How Understanding Prehistory and Giants Helps to Define End Time Prophecy. Going through the editing process right now and should be through and on to the markets by uh, August or September by what we're looking at. And so looking awesome. forward to that launch. Uh, so be a little bit more patient to the Phantom book. I know I keep pushing the dates out, but it's been quite a journey. Um, and we're through the final journey part. We're just now getting down to the details of actually getting it on paper and on digital version and, and out to the market. So on the website, if you wanted to get a hold of me, I know I mentioned probably a couple of documents and I have a complete series on Tolkien and Lewis. Um, you can go to the uh, media page and where it says contact Gary Wayne for uh, an interview. That's my email address. It clicks right through to my email. That email address is genesis6conspiracy at gmail.com. So pretty easy to remember. Same as the website, just gmail.com. And that will come through to me. And it may take me six weeks or so to get back to you, but I will get back to you. Awesome. Awesome. And uh, what about like, youtube or you do you have a youtube I, channel I, you I, I i actually set up a youtube channel i've never used it uh, maybe when i get some time i will do that uh the, i know there are youtube channels out there that uh, have my name on it um just understand about, it's not like, me don't, commenting <laughs> <laughs> but don't don't you do some stuff on like daily renegade and i i did i stopped about a year ago because i just okay. ran out of time trying to get this book out and so i yeah. want to get back on that understandable I mean, I do do a number of shows every month, um, you know, and like on the first Sunday of every month, I do an hour and I cover off a chapter of my book on Tribulation uh, Radio with Brother John Baptist in, out of Florida. Uh, I do every first Wednesday a two-hour Ask Me Anything question uh, with uh, on Zen Garcia's channel and people submit questions. And then when I get through those, I ask, answer the live questions. I do every third Thursday with William Holsenbrook, another basically ask me anything show. Um, so the, those are the ones I have other ones that I do, but they're not necessarily on the same day. So it's really hard to do that once a month thing with them. So, but I, I am hoping to, to get back with Renegade Radio or Renegade TV uh, with uh, with Josh and, and the group there, hopefully once I get this book out and because uh, uh, I really enjoyed putting up a show twice a month on, on his uh, media. Yeah. Um... Josh would definitely be uh, my choice uh, if I had to choose between uh, him or Mr. Garcia, but that's that's just um, 
well, uh, my own personal. Yeah, and, and, uh, and you know, I, th I, I think uh, there's a lot of things that I'll agree with or disagree with people on, on most platforms because we all disagree. Absolutely. What I try and do is get the word out. Yeah. I, and, and communicate and I with people that. and give and them, a, here's what the Bible platform. says. And so whether it's a polytheist platform or different variations of what people teach um, within Christianity and then they'll let the people decide, but it's about getting yeah. that information out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I wasn't at all suggesting that you, you know, you were promoting the beliefs of everyone who you went on their shows. Um, but uh, Gary, I am absolutely <laughs> tickled pink that you came on with us again um i enjoyed it tremendously and i I, well. I really look forward to your new book coming out um i know how long it took me to read the first one <laughs> um so if it's anywhere near as long as part yeah. one it, that, it, that, it is it is shorter it only has 84 chapters <laughs> oh only has 84 chapters. only okay. so. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Yeah, you but are, it is uh, it's, it's specifically targeted at christians this time and i'm telling you um from my heart that i had no intentions of writing a sequel um but with the communication that i have whether it's on social media or emails or uh, shows or answering questions is that there's a starvation out there for what's really written in the bible yeah. and so I was surprised that uh, so little teaching within the churches. I was quite surprised at that. And so this is targeted at Christians about how much is in the Bible about giants. So I go right through uh, the giants. I go right through the hybrids. Uh, I go through the fallen angels and the hierarchy that we get biblically. Um, I start layering in the, the information that you need to help define end time prophecy and then i get into end time prophecy uh, and start laying out a chronology based on what my approach is and i put that approach in the book so people can say i agree or i disagree with his approach but you know how i got there and it's yeah. it's really pretty simple stuff but it is yeah. just it should be that simple and so I, I think it's going to be a book that uh, resonates out there and answers a lot of questions and presents in each of the chapters specific arguments on certain things that will help you talk to somebody who has been told Genesis 6 is a gross exaggeration, that somehow the Bible um, isn't written accurately and things like that. So I really enjoyed doing the work. I, I wish I could have put more in it, but I wanted to keep it smaller. Um, because at, there's a price point where people can't afford and a lot of people yeah. don't want to read forever. So maybe maybe there'll be a third one, but I have a book I'm already into on Second Exodus that I'd like to get out in the next couple of years first. Cool, cool. Sounds great. Um, I, I do want to ask you one last thing because I don't know um, the next time I'll have the chance to talk to you. Um, and if you don't want to answer, you don't have to. I'm just curious because of how long it's been since I have um, seen you two in a video together or live, but I was just curious if um, if you talked to uh, David Carrico anymore. No, we have lost contact, um, and with uh, the two Johns there as well. Um, I have I have no idea why they 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 stopped returning my emails, and um, so I know they're continuing on. I know they eliminated a number of people from who they uh, have on their shows. I. For me, I don't know what it was. Well, or, I, I, or... they they really stopped doing guest segments altogether yep. that I can see. I don't really watch them anymore. Uh, I, don't I, I, I mean, I, I'll say for myself personally, um, I'm not speaking for you, Gary, or for you, Jeremy. From what I've seen, it's sadly and tragically that they uh, have embraced almost Hebrew roots, almost Judaizing, well, in effect. And I've seen John Pounder's um criticize for example and judge uh believers that don't keep kosher i've literally heard him say that out of his mouth well um, yeah and you you will you will especially depending on how how far back um you're listening to and there was a time that they were full into hebrew roots um i will say this for them in their defense that they um they did come out do a video and you know like a, a repentance video saying that you know we were in the hebrew roots we've left and cut contact with 
people that we were associated with in the Hebrew roots, but you know, they are still very much um, sure. Torah observant. Yep. Um, but, and, and I have no problems with people being Torah observant. I, you know, I in fact, I don't, in either, fact, you know, I, I have to say, I agree with it, but yeah. um, I, I have to say, I really like working with them um, yeah. and uh, consider them friends and still do. Uh, and would work with them at, at any point in time. I think we should be trying to unite Christians, not dividing yeah, Christians. Yeah, absolutely. And so, um, you know, I, I, I you know, uh, so I don't know why, but I would, I would work with them any, I mean, I absolutely love doing the midnight ride. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, John Pounders, he was amongst the first uh, to, to do an interview with me. Um, and so, um you know, I kind of, you know, I consider them friends. Um, so I hope they're doing well. Um, so I don't know, you know, what changed on what they were doing, but um, uh, it's, you know, I do a lot of shows. So, but, they're, you know, I, I, I like working with them so much. Would I work with them again? Oh, absolutely. And we may or may not always agree on everything, but yeah, of course. again, nobody agrees on absolutely everything. I don't think um, unless, right. unless you're of a, of a preternatural um, position, which I, <laughs> I think there's only three. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and, and some would say that that's one. So just so that I don't get emails on that, I understand the <laughs> concepts. So. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I definitely agree with you that we should be um, coming together as Christians. I do think that there is a line, you know, if someone is, is, outright changing the gospel you know how you you come to to salvation if it's not through christ um you know and there are some in the the different groups like the new apostolic reformation and the sacred name movement um and there are some in pretty much every movement and i think the movements themselves regardless of the names are the problem you know the gospel was never meant to be um split or torn asunder it was never meant to be divided into yeah, denominations it shouldn't be well you, you know, know it's interesting because um you know i think the bible the new testament teaches us how to discuss when we're in disagreement it and does. that's how it sort of should come about. I would also kind of note that, you know, by the time of John of Patmos, you have seven distinct styles of churches of things they do well yeah. and things that they don't do well. And so it happened earlier on. No, it should be one unified uh, system and one church. But um, until until Jesus returns, um, that's probably not going to be the case. So we ought to focus on what uh, yeah, but... the main principles are for faith and discuss where we disagree but don't use it as a wedge issue we should be trying to figure out how we create uh, an atmosphere where christians can get the information and people see us role modeling what we do and they want to become a christian yeah bottom line is we should be spreading the love and the gospel of christ yeah you know the the great commission um <laughs> We are literally, while our king is at the right hand of the father, we are his hands, we are his feet, we are his mouth. And a lot of times, many, many times, the only Jesus someone will see will be us. And exactly. we need to always remember that, you know, and I think it's one of the reasons, you know, Paul said to, to be careful because you may be entertaining angels unaware. I think he meant it as you may be entertaining actual angels, but also, uh, you know, be careful how you treat people yeah. because, you know, we could be also the only Jesus that they see. And that's me saying that, but. Um, yeah, we don't want to become the Pharisees. Absolutely. But brother, thank you so much again for coming on. Yes. Um, I enjoyed it. And hopefully we can do this again sometime sometime sooner rather than later hopefully it won't take three years for um me to have you on again and i just man i i, I wish that i had just a fourth of your brain or or your um knowledge about 
the different things you write about. That's why, that's why I uh, had to read your book in, in sections and I'll probably have to do the same with the next one. But um, man, until next time, you know, I wish you well and I pray that the Lord will bless and keep you in uh, uh, the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ and for the Kingdom Productions Network and the Remnant Report. I am Pastor Jeremy Anderson, the Remnant Warrior, saying thank you for coming on and uh, good night. Grace and peace, you guys. Amen. I thought that was a pretty good show. Yes, I did. I did think.